Yes? Okay, good. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, so happy to have you here. Uh, yes, my name is Jason Hagopian. I am the president of MCAD, Miami Center for Architecture and Design. For any of you that may be attending one of our events for the very first time and may not know much about us, uh, MCAD uh, and the Miami Center for Architecture and Design is the place for everyone interested in design and the built environment. Uh, we have community meeting space, educational programs, everything to enhance the public appreciation for architecture and design. Uh, we're located downtown and we are the home for the American Institute of Architects Miami, AIA Miami, as well as the Downtown Miami Welcome Center in partnership with Miami Downtown Development Authority. So we are the outreach arm for everything architecture in the community. I wanted to just go over a few of our upcoming events. Um, just give me a moment to cue that up. So first and foremost, um, I'm going to plug an event that the AIA Miami is putting on tomorrow, March 24th at 6 p.m. Uh, it's a woman's, uh, the Women in Architecture Committee, uh, AIA Miami in the footsteps of Marian Manley, Women Founders. For those of you that don't know, Marion was one of the first or second, I believe, architect, female architects licensed in the state of Florida. So should be a really amazing uh, Zoom event tomorrow night at 6. On March 25th at 6 o'clock, another Zoom event uh, uh, created by MCAD, Miami Creative Exhibition, A Decade of Transformation. That's a panel discussion. April 19th, 6.30, save the date, we present a Copper Bridge Foundation Art Deco Rio Platanese um, Zoom exhibit. Uh, April 26th at 7 p.m., uh, we have a Young Urbanist event, which is a full moon kayak tour. I'm not sure if there's still space available, but please check it out on our website. And then May 20th, save the date it's our third annual mcad urban warrior awards it will be a zoom event this year <laughs> next year though uh, we promise it'll be in person this is our biggest fundraiser of the year so please go to our website miamicad.org to see all the exciting stuff coming up so that's it for me uh, i'm going to pass it back over to colleen and she will introduce our session today. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Jason. Um, okay, so I would like to right now introduce our panelists. Um, the first we have is Marty Brennan, uh, who is an associate principal at ZGF um, in Seattle, Washington. Marty's a project architect and healthy building designer with ZGF. He brings over 10 years of experience in computational daylight analysis for clients, including Microsoft, Expedia Group, Roche, and Cincinnati Children's Hospital. He recently co-authored outcome-based design for circadian lighting, an integrated approach to simulation and metrics, and he developed the open source Grasshopper plugin, Lark, a tool for designers to visualize circadian light. He's currently leading the sustainability effort for Microsoft's Washington Village and is collaborating on a spectral lighting system for neonatal intensive care units. Marty holds a master's of, degree, master's of architecture degree and a certificate in lighting from University of Washington. Welcome, Marty. Um, next, we have Darcy Chinnis, um, who is an associate principal at HLB Lighting. Darcy's strong background combines human factors, engineering, construction, art, and energy. I'm exhausted already. She has worked on multiple LEED certified projects, including strong working experience in daylight lighting controls, energy codes, and light pollution. She's also particularly enjoyed projects that require a focus on the user experience, such as lighting designs intended to evoke an emotion or tell a story or meet a special visual need. Um, Darcy's a registered professional engineer in the state of Colorado. She's a well and LEED accredited professional and an active member of the Illuminating Engineer Society and she serves as a research symposium committee chair, a professional member of the International Association of Lighting Designers, and a former member of the board of directors for the International Dark Sky Association. So welcome, Darcy. Next is Eduardo, is Eduardo Ajea. Um, he's the vice president and managing principal of the Miami office of Leo A. Daly. 
He leads design and business developments for Leo Daly's work across market sectors in Florida, the Caribbean, and South and Central America. Eduardo assists clients by improving their business performance through architectural design. With nearly 25 years as an architectural practice leader, Eduardo has directed more than 7 million square feet of design projects. His design and planning work inclu includes major projects at Cathedral Hill Hospital in San Francisco, uh, Guayanabo City Hospital in Puerto Rico, and Mount Sinai Medical Center in Miami Beach, among many, many others. Welcome. And next we have Brian Lomel, the Managing Principal, Director at TLC Eng Engineering Solutions here in South Florida. Brian has over 30 years experience in consulting engineering. He is a mechanical engineering graduate of the Georgia Institute of Technology. He's a professional medical engineer, uh, mechan sorry, mechanical engineer registered in both Florida and Georgia. In addition to being a lead fellow, Brian is also a well AP and a registered commissioning authority uh, CXA. He's provided lead consulting, commissioning, and mechanical engineering for many TLCs, 345 plus award winnings, LEED certified buildings. He shared this experience and expertise in green design through countless lectures and presentations, including for us here at the American Institute of Architects in Miami. So welcome, Brian. Um, so that's our gang. You can turn your cameras on and uh, everybody, uh, all the uh, speakers and um, Everyone, if you wouldn't mind just leaving your, uh, everyone else, please leave your cameras off and mute yourselves. This will give us a, a little bit more bandwidth uh, for the program. And then if you have questions, um, anytime, put them in the chat feature at the bottom of the uh, Zoom screen and we'll get to those if we have time towards the end um, of the um, presentation. And if we don't get to them, if the panel doesn't mind, I can email them the uh, questions and they can just send us an answer via email, which we will share. So. To get started with this um, subject, it's um, something I'm, I've heard about my whole life growing up in northern Michigan, where it's gloomy and cold probably most of the year. Um, you know, we used to have these little light boxes that we would buy and sit in front of in the winter to keep us from, you know, just going out in the snow and never coming back. So, <laughs> Darcy, um, I've heard anecdotally that light can be beneficial to one's health. Um, it made me think you know, there must be something scientific that links health to light. And as talking to all of you, I'm seeing that there is something, um, the circadian rhythm and other things. Um, so we have proved that there are circadian rhythms. Is there any hard evidence that light is truly beneficial to improving health or is that kind of snake oil? Which I've also heard that in reading in my research. I think it's probably a combination of the two. I, I think there is absolutely some hard science. Uh, light is what we call the most significant contributor to regulating the circadian rhythm. So we have a master biological clock that regulates everything from our blood pressure to our digestive systems. Um, and light is the main zeitgeber, the main regulator of circadian rhythms. Um, and that science has been well established for a long time. There's been studies um, within the past hundred years that really confirm that, you know, if people are left without light exposure, if they're left in a dark environment, that 24 hour clock becomes misaligned and their different biological processes will, will start to fall out of sync. And because of that, we often see uh, health problems develop. Um, anecdotally as well, in addition to some of the other longitudinal studies um, that have really focused on shift workers, we've seen that asynchronous exposure to lighting as, uh, you know, daylighting and electric lighting can really lead to some significant health impacts. The interesting part about circadian lighting, though, is that the actual physiological and biological mechanisms of how that happens in the grand scheme of science is a relatively new discovery. So the, the actual realization of how our body is processing that light and how it's regulating the circadian rhythm and realigning that clock, that science is really only about 15, 20 years old at this point. So in terms of applications, it really does take us a long time to go from understanding what the lighting is doing to how can we act on it. I think we've learned over the years of you know, uh, design and experience, specifically in healthcare environments, how light really can support um, both the users of the space, which would be the staff that's there, but also you know, the occupants that are there for um, you know, as a healing environment. Um, and so, uh, yes, it, it is a hard science. We do know that light has an impact. 
yes, there is a bit of snake oil salesmen. It is such a new um, field. There was a very quick rush to market with a lot of products to support uh, circadian and healthy lighting. And so because of that, there's always, we recommend approaching circadian lighting claims with a grain of salt, but understanding that there really is a fundamental solid science background to, to understanding how light influences our circadian. Well, that's really interesting. Circadian lighting is kind of, you know, the overall topic of what we're, we're going to be dealing with, how, you know, humans and light and stuff. But I think first we need to understand, um, or at least I do, a little bit more about light. So, um, Marty, could you talk about um, the spectral power distribution um, and what is computational daylighting and how can it inform project uh, design? Sure. Too much. Just start with the, the lighting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, and I'll, so I'll just share some slides. Uh, so, uh -huh. you know, really when we're talking about light, we're, uh, and specifically daylight, you know, we're talking about the visible spectrum, well, all light, and it's the light that uh, it falls within 400 to 750 nanometers. And as you, uh, there's different devices that we can use like spectrometers to actually visualize the, that, that spectrum. And every light source has a little blue in it, a little green in it, and a little red in it to make it look white. So a white light is really using a mixture of those three areas of the spectrum. Uh, but you know, with uh, tunable circadian lights, we can now kind of control that spectrum and design spectrums around biological sensitivity curves. So we have our cones and our eyes we learned about in high school for vision. We can design lighting to, for the best possible color rendering. But, you know, uh, as Darcy mentioned, we can also design around circadian cells in the eye that uh, are very sensitive to blue light. So this is a spectrum uh, of daylight. This is uh, near my house in Seattle where we had a uh, unusually blue sky day and uh, in April. Uh, so took advantage of that. Very high amounts of light and uh, very blue. But this is working from home. This is the room I'm in now. Uh, you can see an electric light source, like I was saying, you, you get these blue, this kind of peak of blue, this peak of green, peak of red. Well, those are the LED chips that are mixing light to, to create this, this light. So that's, um, is that more for aesthetics inside or is that, you know, and then they get adjusted for health or how does yeah, so so this right here is just like a LED light that uh, I you know got off Amazon. It's not a fancy light. It's it's a warm colored light. So you can see there's a little bit more uh, uh, light in the in the red is peaking a little higher. Uh, so for residential lighting, uh, you know, less blue tends to be uh, aesthetically preference uh, preferential. But uh, from a circadian standpoint, um, it's actually not great during the day. And, and what mm -hmm. we're finding is that overall, we're under lighting our eyes during the day and we're over lighting them at night. So you hear, you know, we, we, we have this issue where we're indoors and a lot of our lighting is designed for like 3,500 Kelvin, 4,000 Kelvin. And outdoors, I'll just show like outdoors is typically anywhere from 6,500 Kelvin up and you know, up to like 30,000 Kelvin if you're in a blue sky place. Uh, and, and you know, sunset is more like 4,000 Kelvin. And that's similar, that, that's more like what we see in office lighting and education and healthcare. And you can, you can see the dramatic difference in the color uh, of these two sources. And that translates into the well standard where you can calculate what they say is the melanopic ratio. And basically that's, it's, it's, it's what that is, is there's a curve that, that right here on the left, and that's the melanopic curve. So as, mo as more light you get under that curve, the more you're stimulating circadian rhythm and you're, the more you're reducing melatonin. So that, that's kind of the key. And, and you can see this light source just has a lot less light under that curve. So that melanopic ratio goes down. So you're gonna have less circadian stimulus from a light source. So, um... so can I interrupt one there? No, 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 for a second. There. <laughs> so Marty, if Marty, if you can go back to slide two for a second. Yeah. So when we talk about all of the uh, spectral radiance coming from the sun and there's a certain bandwidth that is visible light, my job as a mechanical engineer is to keep all the other wavelengths from coming in the building. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because all the other wavelengths come into the building, strike the surface, generate heat. And so I 
cannot count how many times I started talking at the beginning about, hey, we should put some skylights in here and get some daylight in here. And the answer is, I don't want all that heat coming in my building. It's like, well, if you do it right, that's not going to happen. Think of, think of your glass as a filter. <laughs> You're filtering out all these other things and only letting the visible light spectrum through. Um, but that uh, struck me, you know, like it has a great image to show that unwanted radiation that ideally our, our conversation between the electrical engineer, mechanical engineer, and the architect can select glazing that keeps the heat out, facilitates the right wavelengths coming in, and, and plays with the artificial lighting altogether. But that requires two of the three people who are engineers to actually talk to other people. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, uh, speaking as an engineer, I can say, is a challenge. <laughs> um, I'm just going to throw this out here to everyone, and I'm just going to jump into, um, so you're designing using circadian lighting or natural lighting or whatever you're designing. What are some considerations for really sensitive places? Um, all of you, Eddie, Eduardo, um, all of you, um, you know, like say for a correctional institute or a kindergarten, what, you know, what, how can attention to this lighting for the well standards, um, you know, what kind of considerations do you have to think about when designing, say for a correctional institute or, or a hospital? Um, sure. Or, I mean, they used to just design them as boxes, you know, with very few, maybe some windows up front in the reception area, but, you know. Well, um, when I first got into the business, I heard this term called homeostasis. And uh, someone explained to me that that was the state that the body needs to be in balance in order for it to heal. So I, I did some research and I learned about a gentleman named Rob, uh, Roger Ulrich uh, from Texas A&M at the time, who started the hypothesis that natural light uh, promotes the state of homeostasis. So uh, from a very personal perspective, uh, with a family member uh, dealing with cancer, um, I, I thought of, you know, where do we spend a lot of time confined, uh, either in a, in a holding cell or in a linear accelerator vault in a hospital getting uh, radiation therapy? So uh, I made it my mission to look at opportunities and find opportunities to, to uh, provide spaces where that natural light, either uh, through a light well or some other passive technique can be achieved. And I just, I'm just gonna share a quick slide here with you that shows a, what typically is a very enclosed bunker of with walls four to six feet thick. Uh, we can, by manipulating the layout, we can uh, bring natural light into that space, which is typically very intimidating. And um, this is this is a, uh, an example of, of how you can sculpt the the floor plan to not only have natural light into those into those vaults but also throughout the circulation uh, spaces. And uh, let me get out of the slide here. Yeah, like if you get your heart stuck on somebody, like a specifier that is like amazing, then that's a, a rep is not gonna say, oh no, we can't call on them. You know what I mean? We can't what? Call on them, oh, you know? Yeah. If Sorry, I wasn't sure what that was. Uh, so back to the program. <laughs> um, and we're back. <laughs> I, I thought that was, I don't know. Anyhow, so um, that's a really interesting example. Do any of you have uh, any of, uh, you all have examples that you can talk about, about facilities that uh, have been improved by using, um, you know, natural lighting? I, I can give you a, like a, I can give you like a super quick, super quick one and then. Mm -hmm. I'm sure Marty and Darcy have a lot more expertise, yeah. but again, you know, when we, when we talk to a lot of the engineering community, they're skeptical and just make go on all this kind of stuff and circadian lighting. And if you don't call it that, it's like, so when you design your, your NICU, oh yeah, we're worried about the nurses having seasonal effect disorder. And so we <laughs> put this lighting that's in that way because they get up in the morning, it's dark, they go to work, it's dark, they come home, it's dark. And so, yeah, we've always done that in our NICUs and our, in our hospitals. I'm like, that circadian light. <laughs> so, so I'll yield the floor. And I think one of the big things, one of the big things to consider too is the application. Whether 
circadian lighting and the approach of light and health is very different if you're in, say, a school facility where you have people arriving at 7 a.m., leaving at 3 p.m., and then they're going to experience lighting that's, under, that's not under your design control after that. And so the regulation of circadian lighting in that kind of environment is very different than, say, you know, a detention facility or inpatient hospital rooms where you have the opportunity to more carefully craft that 24-hour light exposure. A lot of the science of circadian lighting is really pointing to the fact that your, your historical exposure, so what, is, what you've been exposed to from lighting over the past 24, 48, 36 hours has a lot, a lot of significant influence on what the current conditions will do to your circadian rhythm, how effective that current lighting can be. So when you have an environment where you have, you know, vent, uh, uh, um, memory care facilities, there's been some great studies because people are more or less relegated to those spaces, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so the, the circadian lighting approach there can be more carefully tuned to adapting spectrum and intensity over time. Whereas when you have an office environment or a school environment, what we can do really is uh, provide enough stimulation at the beginning of the day. Uh, the science is generally pointing towards saying, you know, spectrum is important, but really it's intensity. And we chronically have been underlighting our buildings. And so what we really need to do is expose people to bright, bright light early on in the day. If you, the best thing you could do is go out for a walk in the morning and get that early morning daylight exposure. We also need to think about, it's not really something that can happen in transient spaces. So corridors, for example, are exempt from well building circadian lighting requirements because people just don't spend enough time in there to be able to get the dose that they need. So we really need to think about circadian lighting as focusing on spaces where we kind of have control of how long people are there, what direction they're facing, what orientation the space is, and how we can promote those really highlight levels. And when we really think about, you know, the confines of construction when, in terms of budget and energy codes, that always points us towards daylighting as being one of the best solutions to be able to provide effective circadian lighting. So, uh, so Marty, I know he's, he's uh, done um, a bunch of work in this, but I, you know, specifically, you know, as a designer, as an architect, starting from scratch with stuff, I mean, um, how do you, how can an architect design better using natural lighting and while keeping these circadian rhythms in, um, in mind? And um, also, are there uh, computer applications or apps that can help with the design process? Yeah, absolutely. And I was just going to also share real quick, just uh, uh, working off the conversation and what Darcy was saying, which I was spot on is, uh, th you know, this was a, a project that we did for the behavioral health uh, ward in Seattle, where, you know, being, being in Seattle, we, we, we are light deprived uh, for like eight to nine months out of the year. And so th this was a uh, uh, a location where we didn't have easy access to in, in a it was a, a tenant improvement inside a existing hospital and there wasn't access to daylight and a lot of the research you know uh, like Darcy was saying uh, it, with, with certain populations uh, it, it's really critical we know that bright light in the morning helps people with depression we know that bright light in the morning helps people with all a uh, huge spectrum of uh, personality disorders, autism, schizophrenia, and, and, and this is true for all generations. And so, uh, but at the same time, this is a sensitive population that is really uh, benefits in health outcomes from uh, being very oriented in place and space, like knowing where you are, what time it is, having a sunrise, having a sunset. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in this project, we, we actually, had the Pacific Northwest National Labs came out to do a post-occupancy evaluation. And the original design that we had for a 24-hour day with you know, midnight at the top and noon at the bottom, uh, we you know, started out with having you know, this warmer kind of sunrise and then the intensity increases. So as these wedges of light get larger, it's more intense and then it gets bluer. So midday is the brightest, it's the bluest, and then it, it starts to wind down in the evening and get warmer and dimmer. And this is, you know, supporting a rhythm. It's supporting a connection to a place and in our biology. 
But as we commissioned it, we realized, oh, you know, we needed more fade time. We needed more uh, controls to, to add a lot more subtlety to the shifting. So, it, you know, we're not quite able to simulate daylight, but we were doing, using the technology as much as we could uh, along those lines. And, and so, uh, in general, though, when we do have light into the, your question of, you know, using computation, using computers, using software like Radiance, which is an open source program, we can... Uh, pretty easily uh, define, you know, take the uh, optics of a window. We know how much light passes through a window. We know the reflectances of materials. We know the geometry of surrounding buildings and the geometry in architecture and interiors. And we can uh, basically put sensors, virtual sensors in space and measure how much light is falling. We can also define any climate if you have a climate file, whether it's Dubai or Seattle or Miami, we can simulate the light for any time, any hour of the year, and then measure that for different biological processes, look at it for well, look at it for lead. Uh, you know, so there's just a huge amount of opportunity to build that evidence and, and make the case. Oh, that's amazing. I think it's, it's interesting that you're showing that uh, spatial daylight autonomy slide there, uh, Marty, because 20 years ago when we thought we were cutting edge designing the first LEED certified buildings, daylighting was, do you have this many foot candles 30 inches above the floor on the equinox? <laughs> right. And we're like, wow, we are like rocket scientists here figuring that out. That is incredible. And then I went to a Bay Area conversation on the daylight harvesting and they're talking about grasshopper and rhino and all this stuff that i had never heard of it was mind-blowing and i dove into all that and now you know when we talk about spatial daylight autonomy and annual sun exposure and average lux and eml and all these you know it's, it's just we are light years from where we were 20 years ago uh, you know and your understanding and mastery of the software you know is incredible and it's just the things you could do with it i was cracking up here like i can simulate the daylight level at any place on the planet on any hour of the year. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's just so different. I, I tend to work with um, people who are not as sophisticated in the building uh, engineering, not engineering, but the maintenance side of the building and operational. And so I try to push on the architecture and lighting side to get as much daylight in as I can and to avoid having to have tunable lighting just because you're showing this diagram of how we set this tunable lighting at every hour of the day with the intensity of the color i'm thinking man we're doing good to get light bulbs changed sometimes here <laughs> in our buildings and we will get there just like we left you know going from the old calculation to now but um i try to make it as simple as possible for the people operating the buildings at this point but it's really exciting seeing uh, what you're just showing there. I think you make yeah. a good point, right. Brian, that these systems are only as good as they are functional, right? So, you know, the amazing graphics that Marty showed were the results of the strong commissioning agent, I imagine, that's on site and being able to deal with these things. Because you're right, you know, the, the average building owner is, it, if the system is not working the way they want it to, they're just going to override it. They're going to put tape over occupancy sensors, they're going to unplug daylight sensors, and lights are going to be static. And so, you know, part of providing a, a, a full design and support is making sure the commissioning is done right. Well, Brian, you mentioned uh, about being exposed to that here in, in Florida, uh, where we have tons of sunlight and our uh, other panelists are, are, are located in cities where uh, sunlight is, is not as much as available as we have it here. So um, I recently came up on a, a project in which a client uh, was not worried about that, but we had to um, guide them through how valuable it was to move some areas like the staff lounge in this maternity for from the second floor to the uh, long exterior so that the staff would have access to our and the I said, so why, why do they need it? So he said, well, they, they're here all the time and they, they need to get their circadian rhythms in, on check so that they, they, stay, they remain healthy. It's not just the patient, it's also the staff that needs to be uh, taken care of. I think that's an important selling point to 
you know what you're doing right so so speaking of speaking of our climate eduardo it's uh there's a architect from costa rica um whose focus was creative shading so how many times have you had somebody say oh we need big piazzas like in in the mediterranean bruno stagno is, is the architect of three he's like we instead of these big uh, piazzas where the natural light comes in we need trees and we need shading because nobody in their right mind would walk out into the broad sunlight in florida and hang out and eat a sandwich <laughs> so yeah there's a very different experience of light between the the great northwest and and what we have to design to agreed so my, my my challenge right now is how how do we have a software just like the one that marty uh, displayed uh offered to a client how can i uh sell it or justify it to a client down here in florida who who typically uh, is not is it doesn't have a sensibility towards towards light I made that mistake about 10, 15 years ago. I got so excited in these lighting seminars and I got the software and mastered all this stuff and then told the architect I could do the lighting study. And I realized, unlike the energy analysis where we trade back and forth ideas and I'll tell you the energy consumed, there is an aesthetic human interaction to the light that you really don't need a mechanical engineer opining on. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need me to say, hey, Eduardo, let's move this window over here and put this one there and make that one bigger. And I realized very quickly I had just paratrooped into a really bad place. And uh, we got through that's, it. That's our challenge for all, all four of us. Uh, how do we become that trusted advisor to that client uh, and educate them as to the value that this, this thinking uh, brings uh, to every project? Not, not only... Uh, not only in the immediate term, but long term, uh, as it affects their business and staff. And I think too, you know, I think the amazing sophisticated software where you're able to calculate, you know, based on these weather files, produce produce amazing results when this wealth of data is incredibly important. But we often find at the very outset of a project, there are some design guides that can be followed, some napkin style sketches where, you know, really it starts with orientation. It starts with understanding daylight management yeah. and space planning. And so, you know, before we leap headlong into full simulations, we start very early with some real prescriptive guidance. And so how, you know, I'm in the same way, you know, it's, it's kind of not my lane to recommend to the architect to move the window, but we can illustrate, you know, with some of the prescriptive requirements, if we're, if we're in this current situation, you know, we're anticipating that we may have a challenge. Let's, let's sit at the table together and talk about how we can collaborate on a solution. Yeah, th there was a study that came out of Harvard a couple of years ago that the top office perks are daylight and natural ventilation, mm -hmm. right? Daylight and air. Uh, you know, so a lot of clients like take Microsoft, who I've worked with for years, they have a 700 page design guideline to do Microsoft space. And one wow. of the top, if, if any, for any office space that you're doing, no Microsoft employee can be further than 20, 25 feet from a window. So, you know, daylighting is just like baked into how they think about space. And, 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 I, and I find that with our healthcare clients, they are the most sophisticated in terms of adopting and paying for tunable lighting and really pushing innovation. You know, we're working yeah. on a NICU project right now that's gonna have six channels of light. So we can mix in across the spectrum, six different LED chips that are all good at different parts of the spectrum so that we can really get a little closer to daylight. And, and really, uh, the, you know, what we're seeing is that for so long, we've been uh, basically putting the infants, the newborns in darkness it's kind of a, there's a culture in a lot of NICUs where it's just simulate the baby being in, in the belly and where it's, you know, supposedly dark. The research is showing light goes right through our skin. Light gets into our brain, light gets into deep tissue. And there's this research now on opsin 5. It's this photosensitive opsin that's not opsin 4, which is circadian melanopic. It's, op, it's a neuropsin. And neuropsin actually, it's, it's in your skin. It's, it's all over. And so even your skin keeps time. When light hits your skin, your, it's not just going through the clock in your brain, you know, the SCN and to your peripheral organs. It's actually distributed. 
So, and they're finding research that this violet light in particular can help with eye development for an infant and brain development. You know, so how can NICU start to help with brain growth? You know, so it's a whole new avenue on lighting and health. And I share too, I think one of the, um, the challenges that we talk about this is, you know, we're, we're discussing so far one half of the equation, which is how do we provide enough light at the right time of day to support people? But there's the other side of this coin, which is making sure as we, you know, as we brought up at the very beginning that when we're starting to approach evening hours that we are providing darkness. You know, light is only valuable if you have it in contrast to the experience of darkness and allowing your body to you know, resume its normal nighttime circadian rhythm functions. And we do that with an absence of light. So it, it really, it, you know, when we talk about providing right light at the right time, that right time part of the equation really is critical because we need to be providing that counterbalance to ensure that that it's a rhythm, right? We're not just providing stasis to a particular scenario. So, so the absence of light, of light is just as important as the availability of such. Absolutely. So I want to throw this out here to all of you. And I'm hearing, you know, all this stuff is necessary. All this stuff is new science. And you know, some of it's more easy to do than others. Some of it, there's baked in standards, I believe, for light. Um, so what are the, other than working with the clients, what are the reoccurring challenges in designing with light, uh, both as a lighting designer and engineer and like an architect? How, what, are, what are some challenges you're facing? Well, sometimes we, uh, we encounter situations in which we may feel that we are we're co going into uncharted territory and that uh, there is no data, but actually there, there is. Um, the Centers for Health Design have uh, a, a bunch of data available. I'm just going to share their website here real, real quick in which you can, you can go and access a lot of information uh, and save you a lot of time time and, and money. So um, the Center for Health Design was created uh, close to 20 year, 25 years ago uh, in, in California, and it provides a, a complete array of, of evidence-based design data that includes the, the, the introduction and use of, of natural light in, into the healthcare, healthcare environment. And that's, that's my plug-in for the <laughs> and a lot of your organizations have research institutes, right, to challenge, to tackle some of this, these projects with in-house, right? Well, at Leo Daily, we work hand-in-hand -hand with uh, Clemson University's uh, research team on, on healthcare facilities design. And uh, we, we recently engaged them in a project here in Miami Beach, where we have uh, redesigned a maternity floor and the C-section rooms uh, were moved from being inside the core of the building out along the uh, exterior edge so that uh, patients, uh, moms uh, can give birth with access to natural light, uh, which has a direct impact on, on patient satisfaction. That's awesome. Yeah, uh, ZGF, you know, the research, uh, it, it's, uh, it changes all the time. Uh, so we're right now, we've, we team up with University of Washington um, uh, through a, it's a research consortium. And so a student will come in from the, the university and work 15 hours a week at CGF. And uh, so we help define a, a, a project. And so th this next uh, quarter that's coming up, we're gonna work with this Dr. Malika Indonici at University of Washington to uh, keep pushing that LARC software a little further so that we could actually simulate neuropsin, so not just melanopsin, so that you know, designers, architects have the ability to visualize these things because, I mean, I'm a visual person, I'm an architect, so making these things as visual as possible for clients, for facilities, for whoever the stakeholders are, just helps you know, move the conversation. And, and to add to that, to that uh, one thing that we do is that not only we have virtual mock-ups that we do in 3D in the computer, but we build 3D real-life mock-ups in which we bring researchers from Clemson University and they uh, also bring the, the staff from the, from the hospital and we do a mock procedure, a mock surgery, and we document what's been working, what's not been working. We try to simulate the light that we will have in the space everything from the temperature of the room uh, to uh, the, the, the 
potential uh, pitfalls that can occur during a procedure and how we can react to it and enhance the ability of the staff to, to deliver care uh, before the space is actually built, which saves the client a lot of money and, and helps them uh, make sure that they're getting what they really need for their money. Yeah, I'd say in our experience, one of the biggest barriers to implementing any of these systems, um, they, they, well, uh, frankly, there's two. One, it was brought up earlier, nobody really wants to be the guinea pig, right? They want to understand that there is evidence, there is a track record, there's experience, there's lessons learned from some of these systems. Um, and so really encouraging, you know, clients to engage with their peers, um, to understand what other facilities may be doing, what experience and lessons have learned. And then, you know, from a practical standpoint, it, a lot of these decisions come down to budgeting. You know, the aspirational goals set out at the beginning of a project of, you know, putting in the, a, a very sophisticated lighting control system you know, when it comes time for the rubber to meet the road, oftentimes the budget just isn't there for it. And there's, there's you know, ben cost benefit analysis and oftentimes lighting ends up kind of being sacrificed in order to be able to uh, facilitate some innovation in other space. And I think it's a real lost opportunity. You know, your lighting systems that you're installing today are 10, 15, 20 year systems. And so investing today in kind of future proofing based on the research that's available today, but providing the flexibility and infrastructure for how that system might adapt over the next decade plus, I think is an important part of the conversation that often gets missed in that step and it, it becomes a barrier to implementation. Yeah, one, one challenge we see is just, you know, we're trying to get to net zero energy by 2030. And so our lighting loads, you know, for say a high performance class A office might be 0.55 watts per square foot lighting power density, which is pretty low by any standard and LED is making that possible. But like Darcy mentioned, and we talked about earlier, we're under lighting our eyes in our biology indoors. So we kind of need more light. And one thing we found that, uh, Brian, you'd appreciate this, just having more blue is more efficacious uh, to, to deliver circadian light. So if you can get those higher uh, CCT, higher, blue, you know, more blue light, uh, it, you can actually be more energy efficient uh, during the day to get to the circadian. I mean, and, and I would recommend, yeah, get outside for walks during the day, because that is by far the most effective way to get your circadian. Marty, can you speak uh, about one of your projects in which uh, the exterior windows um, became opaque or more clear uh, throughout the day or through the use of a control? I believe it was a, psych, a ch children's a pediatric psych unit. Uh, Somewhere I, th I thought was in the Northeast, if you, if you recall that project. Actually, I don't know it, but it, so it was electrochromic glass yep. change. Okay. Is it called like sage, sage glass? Yes. Sage yeah. Glass. Yeah, which is extremely energy efficient. <laughs> you yeah, know, it, the solar heating coefficient goes to zero, basically. Uh, yeah. You know, the only <laughs> negative is you lose some of the view and some of the daylight. So, right. yeah, you have to balance that. We actually worked with the manufacturer of view, which is, I guess, like sage's competitor, to, to modify energy modeling software so that as the light becomes more transparent, more light comes in, the artificial lighting will shut down. But when you darken that thing up at five o'clock in the afternoon, the lighting comes on more intensely. And we, That's actually and what's happening in project. this facility that, that, uh, that Marty's uh, team designed. Yeah, we had done a research project with VIEW as well, looking at um, the color implications. So most electrochromic glass, as it tints, it shifts very blue. And so you get a very, yeah. very high color temperature and it becomes a place where color rendering, you know, the appearance of color in the space is really sacrificed. And so, you know, when you, when you think about how to employ that kind of electrochromic glazing, we tend to recommend that it be on a minimum of two orientations in the space so that you have, if you have one that's all the way down at its lowest dim state and the color is off and very blue, you can balance it with, you know, less tinted daylight coming from a different orientation. But that same tunable system that we've talked about for providing that, that electric lighting circadian rhythm can also be employed in concert with that um, electrochromic glass to improve color quality in the space. So uh, it, it's taking advantage of both of these technologies to really hone in on how we can provide a, a comfortable and appropriately rendered environment. 
So Dar Darcy, when you combine all, all these systems, all this technology, which uh, cost a, a good chunk of money, yeah. which you, you typically clients down here in South Florida are, are not prepared, uh, not even psychologically to, to absorb. <laughs> um, do you have anybody in your team or, or someone that you bring on board that can also uh, provide the return on investment uh, perspective? Yeah, I mean, the challenge comes is depending on the type of application. There, There's lots of studies that have shown, you know, high quality indoor environmental lighting is significantly correlated with increased productivity. So from a, you know, an office standpoint, a manufacturing standpoint, a lot of locations where you can measure productivity, there, there's a direct ROI there. We see it in healthcare environments, frankly, with bed turnover for inpatient, that you're, you're able to improve how quickly you're able to discharge patients based on providing um, high quality rendered lighting environments. Um, there's been some great studies just looking at electric lighting in memory care facilities where they're able to reduce medication, um, eliminate sundowning syndrome, a, a lot of other kind of amazing benefits that have reduced cost. And so there's evidence, and they're, but they're really limited to those applications. So the challenge always comes is when we're starting to push the envelope. We know that the science is real. We know this application is, is viable, but we're pushing it into a new market and bringing that client along for understanding that in some ways they are kind of the guinea pig. We don't have that direct evidence and we can extrapolate from other markets, but I think the challenge comes is, is really providing them that evidence. There's great research groups out there. Pacific Northwest National Labs really does some excellent work specifically with circadian rhythm, the circadian lighting in healthcare settings as well as school settings. I'm based out of Denver and they've been working a lot locally with uh, some local schools to imp implement circadian lighting systems to really help re re regulate circadian lighting in the school environment. And so we're starting to see a real emphasis on researchers promoting um, their work that can help us cost justify these systems. Um, and it is also a cost conversation because, you know, as we spoke to earlier, it's not just that first cost. You know, the equipment is more expensive, the infrastructure is more expensive, the commissioning is more expensive, and, but you really have to have a team on the building operations side that understands the value of keeping the system functional and maintaining it um, and, and making sure that things are tuned and addressed over time. And, and we also have to have um, a clinician's perspective on, on, from our side uh, as we approach this client. So someone here in the chat is asking, if we could uh, expand into a chroma therapy and, and how light has a, a healing function or a, contributes to the healing. Uh, and and I, I'm gonna yield to, uh, I don't know if, if Marty would like to expand on, on chroma therapy. You know, that, that's a fascinating uh, area of research and, and I, I have been reading up on it. I'm not a specialist on it, but you know, uh, there are certain wavelengths, uh, specifically in the red range, that uh, are most, um, they're very efficient at stimulating the mitochondria. All of our cells, we're made up of trillions of cells, have mitochondria, and, and by uh, stimulating that, it, it, it can actually tone, tone your, your muscle and your skin. Uh, it makes you feel better. It, it actually can have a metabolic and uh, even immune response. Uh, so even we know that getting a little bit of UV, which is the other direction, uh, you don't want too much UV because it can damage the skin, but we actually need a little bit uh, to uh, create vitamin, to get vitamin D stimulation and production, which again has a, a, a secondary function of supporting uh, your uh, your immune system. So there, there were studies that some people who had really good UV exposure were let, were not getting COVID as much. <laughs> uh, so, you know, just having that, that boost. And, and so I think, yeah, we need to look at light, not just visible, UV is important and so is infrared. And that chromotherapy is more on the red infrared side. So I'm, I'm going to ahead learn. and showing one of your, one of your projects, Marty, uh, which is uh, a cancer facility in, in Phoenix in which the, uh, the um, infusion therapy department uh, is flooded with natural light. And uh, we understand, uh, and this was shown as an example in a recent uh, uh, conference, uh, which is an example of how natural light is just as important in the healing process as the actual medication that's being infused in, into, into cancer patients. Absolutely. 
Yeah, I was, I was curious, Eduardo, you know, the Kramer Oncology Center you all did, which is beautiful. I, I saw it in the magazine a few years ago. Did, is there been any post-occupancy evaluation of that or, or any kind of whether anecdotal or evidence of, of you know, the, how it's going? Did it, like, was there a pre or post kind of evaluation? Um, I don't have it handy, but I will be glad to, uh, to look into it. Yeah, awesome. Um, so for everybody, I mean, I know we didn't discuss this before, so I'm just going to throw it out there and maybe ask each one of you, these things we're talking about now are kind of, you know, a, a good solid science has been established. We're kind of the beginning of this kind of exciting new way to go. But l let's look down the road, maybe 20 years or 10 years with this. What do you see as becoming a standard? What do you see as, I mean, and also we were talking about, um, um, some buildings and right now it's incredibly expensive, but new ways of moving light around using mirrors or baffles or whatever. So I'm gonna ask each of you what you think the future is going to bring. And uh, Marty, let's start with you. <laughs> I mean, they just dream, like what yeah. do you think would, would be, we'll be looking at in 20 years? Yeah, I, I think we're all gonna have personalized uh, uh, lighting playlists that will be uh, custom to your genome because some of our genomes are more or less adapted to certain latitudes. So for instance, in Iceland, there are people that have been Iceland who have genes that are adapted to Iceland over tens of thousands of years. And they are, uh, can handle the dark, dark winters. Uh, whereas uh, 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 if you don't have that gene pool, you are much more susceptible to uh, seasonal affective disorder, depression. So you know, Kim, we, we will have the technology to actually uh, tune lighting to you. And as Darcy mentioned, we have these kind of photic histories, like you have a light history. And so how uh, there are researchers at Harvard that will tune lighting schedules for astronauts, because astronauts need to travel, say, from Houston to Florida, and then they got to go up into space and they're wrapping around the Earth every 90 minutes. They are a very high performance group of people. And so uh, there's been a lot of research of getting them the most excellent circadian light to uh, keep them as high performance as possible. And same with baseball players and other, other uh, folks that travel a lot and, and need that light. So I think we're all gonna, we'll have the technology, the lighting to, uh, you know, we'll still say in 20 years, go outside. I don't think we're gonna beat being outside. But uh, I think if you're indoors, we're going to be able to customize light to your best health outcomes. I'm, I'm concerned that after we spend all this effort and money into in, introducing this high design combined with technology, someone's going to come in with some goggles and just put it in, on, put in, in front of our eyes and said, you're done. Just, just, let's just, just run this program. Let's hit enter. And there, you're going to get your, the light, the light the right light, but uh, as, as either Marty or, or, or Brian mentioned earlier, it goes through your skin. You, you, need, you need the actual real thing. So there will not be any substitution or replacement to exposure to natural light. Agreed. I think I'll be in a dark lounge chair somewhere and my avatar will be running around wondering why the light exposure is getting, go, go into the job site and check in construction now. I think it's important to remember that it wasn't that long ago, a couple of years ago, when we were having a hard time down here just getting people to use LED lights. Ooh, high technology, LED lights. And then the response was, well, we bought one at Home Depot and put it in the garage, and I don't like the color of LED lights, so don't use those on my project. <laughs> <laughs> and then I think a weird thing has happened. I was talking to one of my employees, and he said, watch this. I can tell Siri to turn the hallway in my house green. Boom, pow, the whole light turns green. And he goes, I can tell Siri to cut the light power in half. Boom, light power's in half. I'm like, yeah, but why would you want to do that? <laughs> but what it says is that the demand level from the tenants has leapfrogged a lot of our industry. Yes, we have the very specialized high performance, they're all over it. But the average run of the mill corn cell office ten tenant fit up you know, if we walked in and said, do you want, you know, this lighting analysis and calculations, uh, <laughs> spatial daylight and EML, our customers are looking like we're nuts. Um, they're not there yet. They will get there, but they're not there yet. But the demand has leapfrogged 
you know, the, the millennial loves people are going to expect. Just like Marty said, I have my own playlist of lighting. Um, I think that's where it's going. I totally agree with that. I think we're looking in the same crystal ball there, Brian. I mean, my, I think the consumer access to lighting products that can help support them is going to be the game changer where I think we're at a place where, you know, when we, when we think about most of the built environment, people are spending at most a third of their days in these spaces. So we still have two thirds of folks day to try and help them realize a full 24 hour clock of health benefits possible, you know, possible with good lighting support. And also that I think that's coupled by consumer advocacy and thirst for technology. And, you know, I think we're in a we're in a consumer environment right now where people are really interested in innovative and connected home environments. And so while we can we can sit here and you know wax poetic about architectural applications where people may spend you know eight hours per day really it's that other 16 hours per day. What are people's nighttime lighted environment, their evening environments? How are they getting ready in the morning? And the access to consumer-based uh, and marketed and easy to use products that can support those other 16 hours a day, I think that will be the big change. People will start to experience these types of systems in their work environments, in their school environments, and it becomes more of the expectation of the idea of personalization. I can personalize my music, my playlist on the way to work. I can personalize um, all other things of my environment. I wanna start being able to personalize and make it my, my lighting system wherever I am. And so I, I do think, you know, as Marty brought up that, that light playlist, I think is a fantastic idea. You know, what, what makes sense for me? What is gonna support me? Um, and we have the technology to be able to really help people start to adapt that. Um, and I think it'll, you know, it comes about with major generational shifts too, as, as we start to get to people who are growing up more intrinsically buried in technology and personalization. So there will, I think, kind of be a convergence of that expectation of personalization with the technology that can provide it. So you have all that at home, you get in the car and Siri controls the music and the lights mm -hmm. and you get to work and there's a clear plastic lockbox around the thermostat because you're not allowed to touch that. <laughs> <laughs> you can see it, but you're not allowed to touch it. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> the whole rest of the day is your, your personal playlist. <laughs> And well, and, and at RPI Rensselaer Polytech, they did a great study where they actually linked, um, they had simulators that were measurement devices that were measuring people's photic history and then adapting their lighting when they got home. So as they pulled into the driveway, their house knew what lighting they had experienced before they got home oh, yeah. and changed the lighting system inside. So it knows if you just got off of a red eye flight from London and it's going to adjust your lighting inside to be able to be appropriate. And it, it's really an amazing opportunity. That's awesome. I would like to add to, to what my colleagues have shared here uh, to Colleen's question. And, and we, all, we all work with many of us are working together in, in multiple projects. And what does the future look like? Well, uh, every project we, we may encounter uh, clients or, or, or stakeholders who are going to have the position that I'm sharing here on the screen, which is we've always done it this way. Why change? So uh, it, it's, it's a state of mind, it's an approach, it's a philosophy that, that as we all have collaborated in projects, either here in South Florida or all the way over in, in, in Portland, Oregon, is that we, we need to establish that advisorship and trust with our clients so that we can guide them and, and do what they retained us to do, which is succeed. That's a great place to stop. And I would like to thank all of you. And I didn't realize how connected you all were. I mean, I, you know, obviously, you know, the our Miami people, but uh, Darcy and uh, Marty, it's just great that you guys are all connected. Um, and as someone who for many, many years of my career has worked at a place, I worked once six years in a, in a whole building that had no outside lights. It was just a building. It was for a Fortune 500 company here in Miami. Um, you know, we called it the troll house. And so I would go to work in the dark, work all day under these lights and then go home in the dark. And I think it affect, affects you, it really does. So thank you all and bless your hearts for uh, thinking about these things and, and making light not something, you know, the executives had access to light, uh, but the rest of us did not. Uh, so I think that hopefully is changing. Um, and, um, and, and the way that you're all looking at this as a, 
as a scientist, as science and also as practical and, um, you know, giving people ROI for the investment, you know, and hopefully over time these uh, things won't be quite as expensive. I think prices and things are already going down. Um, for everyone who joined us, thank you so much. If you are um, a member of AIA and want the HSW credit, please be sure that we have your um, AIA number. That's very important. This uh, has been recorded and the recording will be available sometime tomorrow. I'm going to email it to everyone along with a short survey that helps us uh, focus our programming a little better here at the Miami Center for Architecture and Design. It's two minutes past and I promised everybody we would only um, go to uh, one o'clock. So I'm gonna let you all go. Thank you so much, everyone. This was a fascinating program and I hope to uh, see everyone again at our next program. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you for having us, Colleen. Bye. Tell Cheryl hello. Okay, I will. Bye. <laughs>